Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Fuel Oil System Equipment and Design Overview. I'm here with Alex Canny. He's a, a New England uh, fuel oil sales representative in upstate, or I'm sorry, in New Hampshire, and he kind of covers the New England fuel oil sales. Alex, are you with me? I am. Great. Let's um before we begin, we want to kind of cover something that we have been working on for a while and actually I want Alex to discuss it and it's our what we call our fuel oil demystified uh, series and I'm going to put that on the screen for you right now um, and Alex you mind just talking about this real quick yeah I'm actually pretty excited about this one that's coming out uh, I know we've been working on it for a bit uh, and we already have one out right now on boiler systems correct Michael correct we do have one on boiler systems yeah, I've got a few copies of that, and it's it's a nice reference. Um, and kind of walking through it, we have a lot of different uh, quick, handy resources here. Um, how how large is this? By 11 by 17 hard copy? Yes, yes, yep. it's 11 by 17 hard copy, laminated. It might be a little hard to read on your screen right now, but uh, certainly easy to read in person. And we're kind of going over some different topics here, like header design, day tank design, pump set controls just real big picture, the kind of stuff that you're looking for. And this isn't necessarily a how to design guide so much as it is a handy reference. And also, um, you know, just trying to give you some, some things that you may go back to in the future regarding fuel oil system design. Uh, we've got kind of different styles of positive displacement pumps, uh, some conversion factors. Uh, it's a really handy tool, something I know I'm gonna be using and I do this sort of thing every day. Um, and also we kind of have uh, a few new things on here. We have an emphasis on our filtration systems, which I know are going to be really important now with things like ultra low sulfur diesel. And uh, Michael, we also have an item on here, our low vacuum anti-siphon valve. That's a new item that's just coming out, correct? Right. It's, a, it's an item that's coming out and we noticed a need um, for anti-siphon valves between um, the generator and a day tank and maybe a generator couldn't pull enough to get through some other anti-siphon valve. So our um, our wonderful R&D department created this low um, vacuum anti-siphon valve to be able to put between a day tank and an anti-siphon or a, a generator. Great. No, that's really good. Um, so, yeah, what we can do if you folks are interested in getting a hold of a copy of these or, or a bunch of these, if you want them for the office, um, feel free to email myself or Michael Sipes. Uh, my email is up on the splash page at the beginning and uh, all over um, the, the uh, presentation at the end as well. Send me an email uh, with your address, and we'd be more than happy to uh, send you out some copies. The other way you can do it is if you go to our website, preferred-mfg.com, you can just go to our website, and let's say you forgot someone's email address, you can go to the contact page, and you can go ahead and feel free to just fill out a little contact us form. Just put your name and your email address and, I'll, um, and an address, and I'll be willing to send one of these out to you um, as soon as possible. Great. Well, that and sounds if, good. Yeah, and if you have more other people in your office that'd like to have some of these, we'd be willing to send those out to those people as well, not just yourself. Feel free to share it. <laughs> sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, and it looks like we're just about ready to get started with the presentation. And for everybody, I, I think we mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation as well, but if you can, please stick around uh, for the end for the live Q&A. Uh, send us your questions during the presentation, uh, and we'll be on the chat channel, but also we'll be going over them live at the end. Uh, and I know for myself, this is uh, my favorite part. I really enjoy your questions. I really enjoy seeing what you folks are doing for projects, uh, getting some feedback, and really digging into that with you. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks again to everyone who's able to join us live and take the time uh, to participate in this. I want to welcome each and every one of you. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to submit those via the chat feature, which should be off to the right. Uh, you can click on that, and myself and some others will be answering some questions as we have opportunity during the presentation. And then afterwards, we will have a dedicated time for Q&A, where we can delve into a little more depth. So looking forward to starting with you, and thank you again for joining us. Welcome to the Preferred Utilities Fuel Oil System Equipment and Design Overview. I am Alex Canny and I'll be presenting to you today as well as participating in the live chat question and answer time afterward. For more information, you can always find us at Preferred Utilities website, preferred-mfg.com, or feel free to just give us a call. Today we're going to be going through several different parts of the topic of fuel oil system design, focusing primarily on 
how to start a new design and where to go from the beginning. Here on our agenda, we're going to be starting with an introduction to the company, which I know some of you are already familiar with. We're going to be taking a brief look at a fuel oil system overview, and then we're going to be spending some time on a design example. Once we've taken a look at our design example for both the amount of fuel in the system, how fast the fuel is moving throughout the system, etc., we're going to take a look closer at some critical components in the system and what's necessary for a good design. Finally, we're going to be taking a look at some fuel oil system controls, as that part of the system is very important, more than just the hardware. And then at the end, we have a section with some fuel oil quality considerations that we're not going to take time to walk through today. But it is a resource that's available for future use and something that we can reference if there are any specific questions about fuel oil system design that impact fuel oil quality considerations. Preferred Utilities is a family-owned company operating continuously since 1920. We are a very engineering-heavy uh, manufacturing company with over 180 years of combined engineering experience, which is probably a low estimate. Our headquarters and factory are located right in Danbury, Connecticut, and we tend to focus on projects and applications for mission-critical facilities. So that's going to be things like hospitals, data centers, production facilities that just can't go down. Now, we do have offices all around the country, all the way out to California and down to Texas. The material that we're going to be covering in this webinar today is going to be focused around the Northeast. I am the Northern New England Regional Manager for Maine, New Hampshire, and I also assist with Boston. And most of the material that we're going to be covering today is going to be applicable to the Boston area. So with every fuel oil presentation, I like to start with a brief system overview. Not everyone has designed a fuel oil system or part of a fuel oil system recently, and so it helps us to get an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about the system. So on this slide you can see, starting from the lower left and then working our way to the right and upwards, we have the way the fuel oil system would be historically or traditionally designed. On the lower left we have a bulk storage tank, which in this case is below ground and outside the building envelope. And the delivery truck would pull right up to this tank and deliver it through the fill connection on the left. This tank would have level monitoring, leak monitoring, etc. And it could be within the building, it could be outside the building, it could be above ground or below ground. Following the fuel as it moves throughout the system, we next have our duplex transfer fuel oil skid. And you'll see we have two transfer pumps on there, which is very typical for a mission critical application where one pump is sized for the full function of the system and then the other pump is a lag pump or a backup if there's any issue with the first pump. Following the fuel from here, it goes up to the generator and it is filling a day tank or a local storage tank at the generator itself. And we're going to be taking a closer look at each part of this system and how we would size each one of these components as well as the piping and valving. Now, directly to the right of the duplex fuel transfer pump set, we have another important uh, piece of the system, which doesn't necessarily transfer fuel to the generator, but it does maintain the quality of the fuel in the system, and that is our fuel polishing skid. Now, I like to refer to this as a fuel polishing skid rather than simply a filtration skid, we're doing more than just removing particulate from the system, we're also removing water, which is the largest driver of fuel oil quality degradation for stored fuel. So when we talk about a traditional fuel oil system, it's going to be similar to the setup we see here. There may be more day tanks at the generators, multiple generators. There may be multiple main tanks even, but typically we're going to have a large amount of fuel stored in one place, and then that fuel is going to be moving to another place to serve the generator itself. And the bulk of what we're talking about today is going to be applicable primarily to emergency generators, as that's the application that we're seeing in mission critical facilities. Some of this could also be applicable to fuel systems that serve boiler plants, but that's not the primary goal of this presentation today. So let's take a look at a fuel oil system example. If we have a new project, where do we start? And how do we get the ball rolling from a blank piece of paper if we have a project? Typically, the way that we're going to walk through a design is we're going to begin with the amount of fuel needed in the entire system. 
and this can be dictated by the owner, by code or insurance. Then we're going to take a moment to size the day tanks themselves that are local to the generators and that will give us the size of the tanks in our system. Then we take a look at how quickly the fuel needs to move throughout the system, sizing the pumps, and that's going to be based on the consumption rate of the generators with a very important caveat that we're going to take a look at. And then finally, we would size the piping and the valves in the system based on that previously calculated fuel transfer rate. So, starting from the beginning, we have our desired runtime. In this example, we're going to take 72 hours. Uh, which is a typical amount of runtime for a mission critical facility. And then we're going to take a look at what is actually burning the fuel. For this example, we're going to say that it's four 2 megawatt generators, which is a fairly large plant. And then we can use a general rule of seven gallons per hour per 100 kW of capacity for the generators. And this general rule, the nice thing about it is it's not very dependent on the model or the make of the generator. It's going to be a good rule and generally conservative across the board. So doing a little bit of math here we come up with our total consumption by the entire plant assuming that it's fully loaded and that there's no redundancy as far as capacity and we have 560 gallons per hour. Now if we multiply our burn rate by our total runtime we get a raw number of 40,320 gallons. And the important thing to understand here is that this is a raw number. Now we have some tools that we can use also on our website at preferred-mfg.com to find out how much fuel you need in your system. Now we're going to take this raw number and there's some considerations that we need to add to it. Understanding that we need a certain volume of usable fuel so we wouldn't run out and specify a 40,320 gallon tank right on the nose. We need to account for ullage and drop tube gap to start. Now, ullage, or eulage, depending on how you pronounce that, is the amount of headspace on the bulk storage tank that can't be filled with fuel. We don't want to fill all the way up to the very top. Drop tube gap is going to be the amount of fuel at the bottom that can't be pulled out because the drop tube for the suction side of our fuel transfer system doesn't go all the way to the bottom. Now, that is by design. Uh, we're going to take a look at why that is. Uh, in some future presentations talking about fuel quality a little more closely. But basically at the bottom of the tank is where a lot of the sediment and the water are going to live. And our polishing system would want to be able to access that, but the transfer pump set would not. So we have an adjustment for that. And let's say we add 10% for ullage, 10% for drop tube gap, and additional 5% for testing and exercising the fuel. Again, this is a 40,000 foot look here at the beginning. We're basically just trying to wrap uh, our understanding around the general sizing of the different components in the system. So that would come up with, let's say, 125% of that raw number. Now, NFPA in 2016 now calls for 133% of design runtime to account for testing, so we would bump that number up to 133% of that raw number. And we'll round that figure to a nominal size, and that would be what we would base our bulk storage tank sizing on. Now that selection could also be modified depending on how large the day tanks are on the system. For a typical single day tank, single generator system, we wouldn't necessarily need to factor that in. But if we're looking at a system with multiple generators, multiple day tanks, we may want to take the size of those tanks into account when we're sizing the total amount of fuel in the system. Now, of course, we're going to take a closer look at some of these components later. Right now, we're just talking about sizing, but it is important when specifying or selecting a main tank. Now, obviously, any of the connections that are available uh, that we are designing, that the sizing, the number, that's all very important. And we're going to take a closer look at some of these components in a little while. Now, moving on to day tank sizing. Again, this is the tank that's located at the generator, sometimes called a belly tank, depending on its size and location and configuration. And we're going to take a closer look at the tank itself and how we would select and design it. But right now, for the amount of fuel that we need this tank to store, it's very important because this is the tank located at the generator. If there is a failure in the transfer system or problem with the piping and valving, etc., in the rest of the system, this is the amount of fuel that the generator has immediate access to. So we want to give ourselves some time if there's a problem with the system and power is down to be able to address that problem. And ideally for life safety or mission critical applications, we're going to be looking at two to four hours of generator runtime from that day tank. Now obviously more is better, 
but we're limited typically by local codes on how large that can go. Now here in Boston, historically, we were requiring 60 gallons or less for the local tank, and thankfully that has changed, and they're now allowing a tank to be sized two to four hours if it's based on a life safety system. And this allows the size of that tank to scale with the generator itself. But ultimately, no matter where you are in the country or what application you're looking at, the final say is always going to be determined by the local fire inspector or local building codes. And we'll take a closer look at how that happens here in Boston. Just a general overview, we have two basic places that these codes are going to originate from. We have our local building codes, and then we have some considerations from federal law as well. And our local building codes are going to come down to things like UL listing for equipment, uh, NFPA for best design practices, maybe some flood resistant construction requirements, things like that, that are modifications and references from the international building code. Now, if we were to ask, depending on the question, for instance, if we have a tank, what should it be constructed from? Well, UL or NFPA might give us an idea of the construction requirements, but if we're asking the question, how far can the tank be located from the wall or how close, that would be something that may be dictated by federal requirements, such as OSHA. So those clearances would come from there. So there are many different places that we would go to answer questions for the design. Now, out of all of those codes, most of our time is going to be spent in the National Fire Protection. And when we look at the NFPA codes, they go from... NFPA 30, generally up to NFPA 110 for systems that we're talking about right now. And they go from more general to more specific. So we have some requirements in NFPA 30 that is generally about stored combustible liquids, but they may be superseded by NFPA 37 or NFPA 110. So if we see something in NFPA 110 that's different than NFPA 30, it's going to be more applicable and take precedence over the previous requirement. And NFPA 110 is the code that we're going to spend the most time in if we're answering questions about mission-critical backup power systems and how to design the fuel oil systems for those. Now, we've taken a look at how much fuel is being stored in the system, both in the bulk storage tank as well as the tanks that are local to the generators. And the next point that we need to design are the pumps. We need to take a look at how fast does this fuel need to move from one point in the system to another. And typically, worst case is going to be used for consumption. We want to assume that generators are fully loaded, uh, that all of the generators are calling at the same time. Now, a single pump would be sized about two to three times the total burn rate, depending on the size of the system. Flow limiters can be used to restrict the flow into a single day tank when multiple day tanks are used. If, for instance, we have a setup where we have a single duplex transfer pump set and 10 day tanks, and we're sizing for the consumption of all 10 generators running at the same time, in a real-life situation, often only one day tank inlet valve will be open and calling for fuel into that day tank. So we don't necessarily want to supply 10 times the flow rate into that one, which would require us to upsize all of those valves as well as any return pumps that are associated with that day tank. Now, one of the advantages of using positive displacement pumps, which is the standard for our transfer skids and recommended by International Mechanical Code, is that they have the advantage of being almost constant flow that doesn't depend on the back pressure in the system. So if we're looking at a system in the design phase, we may not know exactly how many valves are in the discharge side of our transfer pump set how much piping, how many elbows, etc. But we know that our flow rate is going to be fairly constant and we can design based off that. Now, one of the caveats that was mentioned earlier was our general rule of 7 gallons per hour per 100 kW and that there is a case where flow rate may change depending on this special case. And that's if the return from the generator goes to the main tank rather than back to the day tank. And this can cause several issues, and we have a slide here that shows our typical piping arrangement where we can follow from the main oil tank, the fuel goes into our transfer pump, up our supply, and then supplies into the day tank. And we can see that the emergency generator in blue at the top right has its supply and return within the day tank itself. 
So any fuel that's not being burned is going to circulate right back into the day tank. Now most generators, almost all that are on the market right now, will circulate more fuel than they're actually using. And one of the things that we're finding in the field is that the amount of fuel that they're circulating is fairly significant. It can be two to three times the amount that they're actually burning. So if we go to an alternate piping arrangement, some of these rules that we talked about no longer apply. So in this arrangement, as you can see on the top right at our emergency generator, the return line does not go directly back to the day tank. It goes all the way back down to the main oil tank. And if we have this piping arrangement, which I've seen in the field, sometimes it's done because hot fuel is being returned to a very small day tank and can cause the system to trip out on high temperature. Uh, it could be just from the way the contractor decided to do the piping. The problem here is that now we need a supply pump that is much larger than what we had before because the onboard pump on the emergency generator itself is circulating two to three times as much fuel as the actual burn rate. So that needs to be supplied. Now if we're in the design phase, this can throw an additional monkey wrench into the equation because we don't necessarily know early in the design what the flow rate of that onboard generator pump is. We'll know the kilowatts or the megawatts rating that we're designing, but we can't use our general rule of 7 gallons per hour per 100 kW anymore. Even though the consumption is known, the total circulation is not known. And with this piping arrangement, that is the factor that we need to design from. So it's an important note to take and an exception to some of the rules that we laid out. Taking a look at the piping now, we have the amount of fuel in our system and we have how fast it's moving. And now that we have that general flow rate, we can start sizing things like piping and valves. Now when we take a look at our system, if we remember the overview we looked at earlier, all of the piping that's in the system, even though the piping between the main tank and the transfer pump set may be the shortest run of piping physically in the system, it is going to be 90% of the consideration for designing and troubleshooting in the field. And that's because with positive displacement pumps that are quote unquote self priming, that section of piping will generally be under a vacuum, whereas the rest of the system will most likely be under positive pressure. And if you've ever worked with any sort of a hydraulic or hydronic system, something that's under a vacuum can pose a lot of issues. Now one of the things that we want to do right off the bat is we want to make sure that we're not undersizing any of the valves or piping on that suction side and presenting too much of a restriction to the transfer pumps. And it's not just about the size, it can be about the location as well. So when using gear pumps, we want to make sure that our suction value is limited to about 15 inches of mercury vacuum or less. Now the actual net positive suction head required and available may vary by manufacturer, but these general rules are going to be safe no matter what equipment we're using. Typically we're going to be seeing about 5 inches of friction loss in the system, and this is determined by the size of the piping, the size of the valves, etc. That will generally leave us about 10 inches of mercury for static lift, which translates to about 12 feet of oil. So that means right off the bat we know if we have the worst case scenario, which is fuel low in the main tank, 12 feet lower than the suction of our transfer pump set, that's pretty much our limit. If we go any lower than that, any more vertical distance and we're going to have some trouble. Now we do have a very useful online sizing tool available at our website, preferred-mfg.com that we're going to be previewing here in another week and running through and showing some examples and it's a very powerful tool that allows us to do exact valve counts, elbows, pipe sizing and see and predict what those values are going to be for the design phase. But these general rules are going to get us started. Typically depending on the manufacturer and the actual pump head being used going beyond 20 inches of mercury is in the range for cavitation. We want to stay away from that. Now the last part of the system that we need to size is the discharge pipe. And that's the pipe from the exit of the duplex transfer pump set all the way up to the day tank. And the nice thing about this is since it's under positive pressure, we have a lot of leeway. We're not just working with a very limited uh, range of pressure here. 
Uh, if it's a high rise, we can do 100 psi, 200 psi, or more, whatever's needed. But we do want to be within reason. So we're going to size based on worst case scenario and understanding that the fuel flow needs to exceed the consumption. And we did those calculations. Now, historical requirement was that the fuel velocity not exceed 7 feet per second. This was primarily based on the fact that diesel fuel can foam, but really, while we keep that in mind as a general rule, one of the most important ways to keep diesel fuel from foaming is to make sure that on the supply side of our system, any time we're putting fuel into a tank, whether it's the main tank or whether it's a day tank, that we have a dip tube that drops that fuel down below the surface of the fuel that's already stored in that tank. So we're not just cascading fuel into the tank and causing that foaming. Now for our return pipe that comes from the day tanks back down, we will generally go one size up. So if we have, for instance, three quarter inch supply piping, we'll do a one inch return. Or if we have one inch supply, we'll do inch and a half return and so forth. Now, I'd like to take some time to look at the critical components that make up this fuel system a little closer. We talked about how to size some of these components, but we need to take a look at the qualities that these components have themselves and what are some of the minimum requirements for a mission critical fuel oil system. Taking a look at the heart of the system, the pumps, there are really two different types of pumps that can be used for fuel oil applications. We have turbine pumps, which are commonly called submersible pumps, and then we have gear pumps or positive displacement. Now the primary difference between these two is that for the submersible pump they are going to be a high volume output for the same horsepower, but they are very limited on the amount of pressure that they can have. For a positive displacement pump, they're typically going to be a lower flow rate for the same horsepower, but they are going to have a very flat output versus back pressure curve and going to be go to a much higher pressure. Now these are going to be necessary for high rise jobs or remote fills, any application where we need a large discharge pressure. And the nice thing is, as we said before, that flow rate is going to stay fairly constant even if our output pressure does increase. Now with the submersible pumps, one of the advantages is that having a relief valve is not as necessary. And this is an important safety consideration for our positive displacement pumps, where if someone was to deadhead the discharge, we need to make sure that we have relief valves that are going to discharge that excess fuel and relieve the pressure. And one note that I would make here, when we're talking about critical safety components, there are two different styles of relief valves that can be used on a system. There's the internal relief, which is installed directly in the pump head, and then there is the separate relief valve, which is piped onto a skid. The separate relief valve offers an advantage because if we were to deadhead this pump, it is still going to flow fuel through the pump, through the discharge, to the relief valve, and then the relief valve would divert that fuel back to the main tank at low pressure. With an internal relief valve that's installed in the pump head itself, it merely circulates a very small amount of oil from the discharge right back to the inlet. And this small amount of fuel is not going to be useful long term to continue to lubricate the internals as well as maintain a proper operating temperature. So in this case, an internal relief valve may not be appropriate for the transfer pumps, but you will see it on things like the polishing skid or return pumps at the day tank that aren't necessarily as critical for providing fuel to the generators themselves. Now the package pump set offers a lot of advantages and this is going to be typically how we see these in the field now. There are still some applications where we'll see the transfer equipment being designed piecemeal and the contractor will purchase each part such as the strainers, the gauges, all of those different things. But the advantage of having one manufacturer or a sole source of supply for the skid itself is that necessary safety, such as the relief valve that we just talked about, all of the gauges, the strainers, things like that, are all going to be sized right from the get-go properly. Whether it's a safety or whether it's just a pressure drop across the strainer, all of that is going to be coordinated at the factory and can be required to have a factory test to make sure everything is working before it shows up at the job site. And that includes the controls as well that we're going to take a closer look at later. Moving throughout the system, another critical part of the system is the remote fill port. 
So this is the part of the system that the fuel oil delivery person is going to be interacting with. They're typically not going to have access to the main tank itself or to the other controls. So this is the part of the system that's going to indicate to them any sort of alarm conditions like high level in the bulk storage tank that they're going to need to know about. And these can be installed in ground, in wall, they can be set up for gravity fill or pumped in fill. Now, the important thing to note about this piece of equipment, at a minimum, what we should be looking at is an audible and a visual alarm. And the audible alarm will come on immediately once high level is reached in the main tank to indicate to the fuel delivery person that they need to stop providing fuel to the tank. The visual alarm, however, will not silence after the 30 seconds or after acknowledgement by the fuel oil fill person. That will stay on. So if somebody shows up 30 minutes later to supply an additional amount of fuel, they'll see a sign and an indication that says if this light is on, the tank is already full or already in high level. The next component we're going to take a closer look at is the day tank. And this is one of the most important parts of the entire system. As we mentioned before, this is the part of the system that provides fuel to the generator should the rest of the system fail. There are many different styles, sizes, and shapes. Um, we have here two examples off to the right. On the top, we have a traditional day tank that would be used in an indoor application with an open rupture basin. This allows easy testing of the interstitial leak. And then we have below that a picture of a belly tank, which is one of our more modern designs that we're seeing more and more of. Uh, as you can see, it's a bit shallower and larger, and it has an enclosed secondary containment. Now, when we're looking at day tanks, obviously they can be any size or shape, whatever is best to be custom built for the application. And the components on there, we're going to have level control, leak detection, and in many cases, especially for mission critical applications, return pumps are a great idea. Now, from some design standpoints, people would see that a return pump is a potential for fuel being removed from a critical part of the system. But with proper design, proper safeties in place to prevent that, they actually add a lot of functionality to the system and far outweigh any of the downsides. Whether it's to remove fuel that is poor quality or to remove fuel that has been overheated by generator return, they are going to be critical for that as well as testing. So if we have this level sensor here and we're not burning enough fuel with periodic generator testing, to allow the fuel level to come down and test the level sensors themselves, this return pump is going to allow us to do that manually on a periodic basis. And we want to make sure with the day tank that we're specifying the number and sizes of the connections. So it's very important that we have these connections on there. Some day tanks will have a proprietary connection or won't have something standard like an NPT fitting. It's important to understand that if these don't have a standard connection, the tank itself may last for a very long time, but the electronics that are hooked up to it, not as long. So we need to keep in mind that for future retrofit, it may be important to have a standardized connection on there. Taking a look at another comparison, we have day tanks versus belly tanks. And if we think about those two pictures that we just saw, the belly tank being the one on the bottom and the day tank on the top. Now with day tanks, you're generally going to have more tappings, more standardized tappings that are going to allow better sensor retrofit, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and it's also going to give you an advantage as far as measuring the fuel in it. So the entire system runs off the level sensor in that day tank, whether it's the transfer pumps or any of the alarms, high and low. And when we have two tanks that are the same volume, but one of them is very shallow and one of them is taller, then the taller tank is going to have better level control. It's going to give us a little more runway on the high and the low and larger space between those level points. Now with the belly tank, obviously there is an advantage because they can typically be packaged with the generator. You see many cases where the enclosure itself, the sub-base floor, is the belly tank or the sub-base tank as it's called. So it can be easy to specify and install but it can pose a challenge when trying to integrate those level controls that are inside that tank with the existing control system. So we generally recommend that the sensors be provided by the fuel oil controls manufacturer for better integration because then we know that when startup comes and the two parts of the system are integrated that those electronics are going to talk to each other and that the signals are going to be what they need to be. 
Now, what are the day tank instruments that we would typically see? Since this is such a, an important part of the system, I want to take a closer look of those items that are going to be installed in the day tank. And there is a design philosophy difference between the level sensors that we would use on the bulk storage tank and the level sensors that we would use on the day tank. For the bulk storage tank, we're not trying to so much control the level beyond just preventing an overfill. We're merely trying to inventory. So we would use an analog sensor. For the day tank, we're not just trying to determine how many gallons are in there. We are trying to specifically control the amount of fuel in there. So as you can see off to the right, we have a picture of a multi-point level sensor. Now we're not using an analog. An analog is great for determining the exact number of gallons in the tank. But as far as reliability, an analog sensor could possibly malfunction. And typically it's not going to be designed for the total range of the tank. If we have a three foot tall day tank, we're going to be using a standardized analog level sensor that could be calibrated for 10 feet originally from the factory. If it was to lose its calibration, now the pump off location or the high level location is going to be feet above the day tank. By using discrete level point sensors, such as the one pictured here, where we have four floats, typically these are going to be 40% at the bottom, which is low, 50% is the next one up, which is pump on, then we have pump off is the third one up at approximately 80%, and then 90% is going to be our high alarm. And obviously we can add redundant, low, and high, etc. to this. That is going to give us level points that are never going to lose calibration. They're never going to move. Each one is permanently fixed at a certain location and we don't need to worry about them. Now, in an advanced system where the customer also wants to know the exact number of gallons that is stored not only in the main tank but also in the day tanks, we can provide a backup analog sensor to work in conjunction that will just indicate the actual volume of fuel that are in the day tanks. Some other devices that you would see on there are leak detectors as well as RTD probes as the temperature of the fuel in the day tank is something that's becoming more critical as we talked about before with generators returning hot fuel or here in the northeast with fuel getting cold as well. So being able to tell what the temperature is at each part of the system can be important also. When talking about the day tanks, you may have noticed on some of the previous diagrams of the valves that are at the inlet. Now, if we have a multi-day tank system, of course, we only want to put fuel into the tank that's calling for fuel at that one time. And the way that we do that is with an inlet supply manifold. And this can be as simple as just a single inlet solenoid with a manual bypass, or it can be much more complicated with multiple normally open, normally closed, flow proofing switches, things like this. At the minimum, we want to make sure that when we have something like an inlet solenoid or multiple solenoids that we have a manual bypass. This is very important for two reasons. Number one, solenoids don't last forever. We want a way to manually bypass around that if there's a malfunction and be able to take out the faulty valve and replace it. Number two, if we have a situation where we need to manually supply fuel to a day tank, most transfer pump sets that are up to modern standards are going to have some sort of a microprocessor which looks at all the leaks, all the statuses and indications, and then turns on and off based on that. But it will also, if the microprocessor or PLC is down, have a handoff auto switch, which allows the system to bypass that microprocessor and manually turn on the transfer pumps if necessary. Now in that case, it will not have the automatic operation to open an inlet valve to the specified day tank. It just turns it on and off. So what we would need to do is have the end user open that bypass valve on the day tank that requires fuel to allow fuel to flow into that day tank and then close it once it's full. Now a note here on valves that are used in a fuel oil system. On the day tank side, we're typically going to use solenoids. They're fast acting and it's the industry standard. But if we have multiple main tanks, or if we have more than one bulk storage tank, it's important that we use motorized ball valves with end switches. And that's not only for safety reasons, but also for operation. We need to know for sure if we're pulling fuel from one main tank that we're not returning fuel to another main tank, which could cause an overfill. Or worse, if we have fuel being pulled from one main tank, but valves are not open for a return, we now have a problem where our relief valves are not going to work properly. So we need to make sure that if we're dispatching fuel from multiple main tanks, 
that we're using a slower acting and more robust motorized ball valve with end switches so that we know 100% whether or not those valves are open or closed. Taking a look at leak detection, this is going to be present for the day tanks as well as the main tanks and it's pretty much going to be required in any sort of double wall tank. There are multiple different kinds. We have uh, many different systems out there depending if we're talking containment piping or a tank or a sump and we have leak detectors that can discriminate between the presence of oil or water or even vacuum based systems. So there's a lot of different options out there and depending on what kind of system you're using there may be one that's best for that. Now the skid that we talked about very early on that's not part of fuel transfer but it is critical to the system as far as maintaining the fuel is our filtration unit or polishing skid. Now this unit is actually becoming more important as time goes on because we have systems that are larger stored fuel. Uh, we have things like ultra low sulfur diesel which can contribute to long term fuel storage issues. So these are becoming more and more important. And as I mentioned before, it's not just about filters and strainers. It's also about having a stage like a centrifuge or a coalescing stage where we're actually pulling water droplets out of suspension in the fuel, removing the water from the tank, because the water itself is going to be a major driver of fuel oil quality issues. All right, we've taken a look at what a traditional system is. We've looked at how to design and size the major components within that. We've taken a closer look at some of the critical components in a fuel oil system. And now I want to take some time to focus on this section, fuel oil system controls. Now we have all this great hardware, all these valves, these tanks, pumps, etc. But the controls are what makes everything work together. So let's take a look. Now, a typical control strategy you're going to have a control panel uh, likely located at the duplex transfer pump set. It's going to be interacting with the pumps. It's going to be taking a look at those level points in the day tank. It's going to be taking a look at leak detectors, which could be located at the day tank, the main tank, somewhere in containment piping, and many other devices as well. As well. But typically, this is the minimum amount of controls you're going to see for a generator system. While there are a lot of standard pump set control panels out there, it's important for mission critical applications that we take a look at each and every application to make sure that the sequence of operations and the controls are tailored for that specific application. Custom design is going to be key to reliability here. Now the advantages of modern controls where you have a PLC or a microprocessor is going to be the amount of I.O. that you can look at, uh, the amount of functionality, but also the recording of alarms and events. Much of the troubleshooting that we do on a system like this isn't done while the problem occurs. Many times it's done after the fact. And so having a detailed list that's time stamped with a text indication of exactly what happened and when it happened is going to be crucial to making sure that this system is running in tip-top shape. And a requirement that's becoming almost ubiquitous is that the system is going to interface with a building automation system or a building management system. So having a modern PLC or microprocessor based system is going to allow us to integrate with those much more seamlessly. Taking a look at another comparison, historically we would see a lot of relay based panels and the functionality worked for what it did, bringing the pumps on and off. They were uh, less expensive and as far as parts obviously relays can be purchased at a lot of different sources but as we mentioned the detailed error enunciation and recording for PLC and microprocessor panels is going to be almost required for any mission critical application that along with the fact that the packages can be UL approved uh, we're going to have much more visibility so that the person showing up to operate test or respond to an alarm is going to get the amount of information that they need immediately there have been many advancements in fuel system control. So our historical system would have been relay-based panel. A more modern system would have a microprocessor panel at the duplex pump set. But then pushing on into the future, we have many applications where peer-to-peer -peer communication is also important. So we have an advanced system where the controls are not just located at the transfer pump set, but we have controls located at day tanks, at main tanks, at the polishing skid, and they're going to all talk to each other through a redundant controls network. 
Now this offers many advantages, especially with operator interfaces at each location, where if somebody wants to test the functionality of a day tank, they can remotely operate the transfer pump set from that location and see every other location operating simultaneously through a touchscreen or another interface. Here's an example of just one setup where we have multiple day tanks at an upper level communicating with main tanks down below, transfer pump set, we have our connections to the building automation system, and everything is talking to each other. Now, one of the other advantages of this is that since it's operating over a hardened, redundant communication network, all of the wiring for a large system such as this is greatly reduced while increasing redundancy. So we don't need a pair of copper for every level point, for every leak detector. We have our communication lines that can be run and save on all of that infrastructure. Here's an example of some of the screens that we would see for a typical system like this. We would see our main tank starting in top left. Top right we have our transfer pump set. As you can see in this condition we have fuel flowing through pump number two which is confirmed to be running and being supplied to the system. If we were to go to another tab on the lower left here we see our day tank. In this case we have temperature measurement, we can see the state of the inlet solenoid valve, we can see the level of the fuel and where it is as it pertains to the control points, and we can see the state of our return pump. On the lower right we have another example, as I mentioned a lot of this can be applicable to a boiler plant even though that's not the main thrust of this presentation, but here we can see our different boilers which are calling for fuel, and all of this can be seen throughout the system if we have peer-to-peer -peer communication at different locations. And the advantage of this, anyone who is to respond, they're not merely seeing lights and switches in a certain state, certain lights on, certain lights off. They're able to immediately visually understand what's happening in the system. And if there was a malfunction, they'd be able to see at the bottom where it says no active alarms. That would give them an indication with an actual text alarm saying what is the problem, if there is any, in the system. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, that took the time to watch and listen to this webinar. I definitely enjoyed presenting it. Again, my name is Alex Canny, and I am here in the Northeast with Preferred Utilities. You can reach us at the numbers shown on your screen or at our website, preferred-mfg.com. We're also on LinkedIn as well, and we try to post some articles and updates on there. All right, right now we're going to transition to the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And I really look forward to interacting with you folks on the questions that you have, any comments that you have on the content, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back, everyone. Great to have uh, everyone here. Let me just see if we have any questions in the chat. You can put a question right it should be on the right side of the screen it's a little um three dots or it's a little uh bleep with the question mark alex are you uh are you with us yes great terrific um look to see if we have any questions we had uh one about the presentation being available afterwards and uh michael this will be on our youtube channel correct correct yeah we always we always re or record these presentations along with the question and answer section and then we post them on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and you po and you look up preferred utilities, um, it should come up. Um, you can just watch it there or you can also go to our website and you can look under um, resources and we have a whole webinar database of all the webinars we've done from combustion control to renewable fuels to fuel oil and we do webinars on all those so you can watch or binge all your favorite webinars there. Sounds good to me. Uh, looks like we have a question that just came in from Mark Edhammer uh, regarding inlet supply manifolds. I think this is a really good question because I know I often get this question a lot at the design phase when we're looking at a single tank system. Um, so his question is inlet supply manifold solenoid. I uh, had a system with only one belly tank and one pump set, and I did not think there was a need for this manifold, but I had a salesperson saying this was really needed for safety. What are your thoughts? So really the way that I split devices like this up are their their function and then their, their safety function, right? So it is true that in a situation where you have a single belly tank or a single day tank, you don't necessarily need an inlet solenoid or an inlet manifold 
to direct fuel to the correct tank, right? It's only going to one tank. And I can understand where, especially because solenoids are not necessarily the most reliable over decades, right? Um, I can see where there'd be some hesitancy, you know, maybe this is considered a single point of failure in some cases. Um, but I think where they're coming from, I'm not sure who you talk to, but I think where they're coming from is probably the fact that it doesn't just provide a function on multi-tank systems, but it's also uh, designed to prevent an overfill. So the safety function for this, uh, beyond is just normal function, is that if it's set up with a proper control system, it's going to also prevent fuel from being provided into that tank if it's in a critical high condition. And the way that might be set up, you might have a sequence of operations, something like um, we have a high level and a critical high level. And we have the ability to run in automatic or manual up to high level, um, but we're not allowed to go beyond critical high level and manual. So if somebody walks up to the pump set that has access and decides to turn the pump set on, even if you have a single day tank, single belly tank scenario, um, unless you have some sort of valve denying fuel now to this tank at a certain level, if it's an automatic, that fuel is going to go somewhere. Um, so you could have a situation where now you're overfilling the tank. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely a safety protection there. Um, and as far as I've often heard some pushback, you know, as far as, um, the failure rate on solenoids, one of the things that we always do, uh, whenever we do an inlet solenoid manifold, is that we make sure we have a bypass line with isolation valves so that we can pull that valve out of service. And not only so that we can pull it out of service for replacement, but also if we're running in manual, uh, let's say lightning hits the controller, we're running in complete manual mode, whether it's one tank or multiple tanks, we're gonna need a way to be able to bypass around that valve. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a bit of complexity. Uh, inlet manifolds can have uh, things like flow restrictors. Um, you could have multiple solenoids. You could have one that's normally open, one that's normally closed, uh, and and the first one being used for operation, the second one being used for denying fuel on a critical high situation. Uh, but that's probably where that salesman was coming from. And depending on the complexity of the system and the concerns of the facility, it may be legitimate uh, in many cases to have an inlet manifold on a system where we just are supplying one tank. So there's a lot of other considerations there. Uh, Michael, looks like we got some other questions here. Do you want to uh, pick the next one? Yeah, sure. Let's just go over, um, let's just do the next one from Alex. Um, Alex, you didn't send this one in, did you? This isn't your sub name? <laughs> uh, that's not my alias, no, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, what do you think about use uh, the use of anti-siphon valve um, and foot valve on the main tank? Do you need both? So. Great. Great so question. there's a definite use for both um, in different scenarios. And actually, this is a item we cover on our Fuel Demystified series. Hey, yeah. how handy is that? Nice. So, um, go ahead, Alex. I'll let you um, definitely send a copy of that as well. Yeah, um, I think a lot of times these are seen as two different devices that perform a similar function. But really, there is a bit of separation there. Um, the anti-siphon valve is designed to only allow flow when a certain head pressure is overcome. So if, if we were to take a sledgehammer to the inlet to the pump set uh, and open that pipe, all it should drain out is just what's in the lowest run of that pipe. We shouldn't be siphoning any fuel out of the tank. And the way we accomplish that is with a spring loaded poppet on that anti-siphon valve um, that will then open when the pump provides that additional marginal uh, suction to overcome the spring in the anti-siphon valve. The foot valve really performs a different function. The foot valve is, is more like a check valve that goes to the bottom of the drop tube into the tank. And that device is really designed to prevent backflow. Now, can there be some overlap? Yes. So if you have an anti-siphon valve on a system, is it true that in some cases that anti-siphon valve will prevent backflow and kind of copy some of the functionality of the foot valve? Absolutely. Just like a check valve would at the, uh, the top of the tank. I, I've seen that before. Uh oh. The reason that a foot valve is different than uh, an anti-siphon valve or a check valve up at that high, because remember, an anti-siphon valve to be effective has to be installed at the highest point of the line on the suction side. The reason the foot valve is different is the foot valve goes all the way to the lowest part, the, the earliest part of that suction line. And the reason we want to do that is if we have a functioning foot valve and we're not getting fuel just spilling out onto the floor somewhere, we're not going to lose prime. 
And if we're relying on and, and losing prime, meaning, okay, we now have um, air getting into the line and fuel bleeding back into the main tank. And that's a very common situation. Um, I would probably guess that 50% of the systems out there have some sort of compromise on the suction line. And it, it could be the suction line was installed perfectly fine. It's just that it's a lot easier to suck air into a line under a vacuum than it is to push oil out under pressure. And so this foot valve is performing a very vital function, which is keeping oil charged in that line and not allowing it to drain back. And it's important that it's down at the bottom of that drop tube, because even if we rely on the anti-siphon valve to do that, there are places between the anti-siphon valve and the bottom of that drop tube where we're still not protected. So each one, while there is some overlap and you could see how maybe one could help out the other in certain scenarios, they are really performing two different functions. And uh, if I need to make sure that I'm gonna keep prime, I'm gonna use a foot valve. If I need to make sure I'm not gonna siphon, I'm gonna use an anti-siphon valve. And there's no issue with having both on the same system. We often need to do both. Right, absolutely. That's a, that's a good question. Let's uh, look for another one. Uh, you guys have some good questions here. Uh, why, uh, why return line to day tank to be one size higher whereas i think maybe it means higher or larger whereas return fuel quantity is much lower than the fuel supply to the generator this is a a good yeah. question and uh one that i've actually had in the past as i was learning fuel systems yeah so to be honest with you functionally it doesn't do as much as people think it does um so it's a good idea i think the assumption is and and with some of the codes that well you know, if we have a one inch supply line and we have a two inch or a three inch return line, we're good. I mean, and the implied statement there is that if we were to overflow this tank, it's going to be sized large enough so that we can return all the fuel. The problem with that is, especially in a situation where we have multiple day tanks and we're sizing our transfer set to cover worst case scenario of all the day tanks calling at once, and we don't have any sort of flow restrictors into that day tank. I've actually been on a job site where we had. I think it was a three inch return line. So very large and something like a one inch supply line. And I learned a hard lesson that day. And the lesson was you will put fuel all over the room in a situation where you're supplying a very large volume of fuel through a one inch line being forced through that line by a supply pump actively at pressure. It isn't always gonna choose the three inch return line as the easiest path, right? Some of it does, but as some of it does, it creates a back pressure on the system and some of the fuel decides to go out the spring-loaded emergency vent at the top of the tank. So, you know, it, it is important to follow some of these rules, and it is something I'd recommend on every system. You know, typically, if we're looking at design, we're going to go one size up. But it's important to also really dig into it and work with somebody who has experience to know that, okay, at this flow rate, at this volume, at this possible head pressure, do we also need a return pump? Because as good as it is to have that overflow line, the overflow line isn't necessarily going to be effective just because we call it an overflow line. So I'm working on a project right now where we have a 600 foot run back to the main tank from a day tank. And even though the elevations are right, we can size the pipe correctly. It's probably going to be critical for us to have some sort of active return on that line because we just can't rely on the fuel taking the easiest path back to the tank when that's not the easiest path at that point. So those are some right. of the realities to deal with, but it's a it's a valid question because you see that across. Anytime you go to design something, that's something that always comes up, and it's it's probably a carryover from a previous time, and it's something we still do, but it's not the whole story. Can't always rely on the fuel to be smart. Yes, or do what you want it to. All right, uh, let's do another one. Um, return pump. I like the thought, but when I have a generator with a belly tank, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't know where I can pump, and the issue of containment for this pump. Have you seen this? Okay, so let me read that again. Return pump. I like the thought, but when I have the a generator with a belly tank, I don't know where I can put pump. Okay, so I doesn't know where I can put the pump, sure. and the issue of containment for this pump. Um, so what have you seen regarding issues or placing a pump for a belly tank? I know uh, you have a lot of experience with this with um, up in New England. Yeah, so we're seeing a ton of belly tanks. Uh, at the design phase, it's one of the things that I try to help the engineer work through to say, you know, is a belly tank going to be the most effective solution for this if we need something like a return pump? And it does present a challenge. Uh, we have been successful in several projects finding a space for the return pump. Uh, the return pump doesn't always have to be, you know, it's, it's usually not a skid. Right? It's usually a pump and motor assembly on a piece of C-channel. Maybe it's like a foot long by six inches wide. 
eight inches tall. Um, and then we have a small motor starter panel on the wall that gets wired up. And then this return pump would, you know, go to a double tap bushing on the belly tank and, uh, and have a small drop tube down into the belly tank. So it is doable. Um, containment, this is actually becoming a bigger thing as far as the actual containment within the generator enclosures. Uh, I know FM Global is now requiring uh, some new things as far as like drip trays under the supply and return lines all the way to the connection at the generator. Um, it can get quite complicated as far as containment when we're talking about generator enclosures. But, um, you know, if we had to, we could look at it job by job, put a drip pan under it or something like that. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do if we're, you know, with a belly tank, this is one of the, the drawbacks, right? If we have a day tank inside a generator enclosure with a rupture basin, we put the return pump right on top of the day tank and the rupture basin now becomes containment for that return pump as well. So yeah, that's a really valid question at this point. Uh, we'll probably take it on a job by job basis, okay. but we have been successful in, in implementing those on belly tanks. Well, Alex, I think the that's the benefit of preferred is we have many engineers on staff. We don't just, we sell a lot of standard products and a lot of standard pump sets, but you know, to keep, to keep uh, engineering at a minimum when you're doing a new job, but, in some situations, there's going to have to be a little bit of engineering and our engineering department's willing to, and, and you to look at jobs and to be able to figure out the specific needs for this job. And if you want something that's not standard, Preferred is more than willing to help uh, end user or customer out to build that and uh, to get you exactly what you need that will help you sleep at night or um, what the job requires. I agree. And, and really it's, the interesting projects are not the ones where we're just selling a standard pump set. The interesting projects are the data centers, the hospitals, the facilities, you know, that need a, they need redundant systems on hot standby, right? Controls that are taking, you know, doing things that fuel systems haven't done for the last hundred years, for the last 50 years. Um, and that's really where we specialize, you know, getting the controls, getting the systems operations um, to work in very complex situations. Right. All right. Let's do, um, let's do one more. If um, if we don't get to your question, what we'll do is we'll try to finish uh, answering them either via, via email. I just want to remind everyone about the fuel demystified. If you're interested in having a copy of that sent to you, go ahead and email Alex um, or myself. Reply to the email that was sent to you, and we will with your address, and we'll send one to you. Um, I can email you a PDF, um, but this is an item that. It's a, it's just something kind of a good, it's not, we try to make it as little as salesy as possible and just as much information as we can cram on a 17 by 11. Um, that's the amount of information we crammed on it. So um, I'll throw up another picture of that. But as I read the last question, is it possible for, uh, is it possible for the size of the supply and return line to be equal? If so, will that cause issue on the system? Thank you. I think we might have answered this question already. So it's kind of related to the, the previous question about the overflow line or the return line. Um, they can be the same size, except unless local code or inspectors require it to be, you know, larger return line. Um, I always thought it was, you know, if you really think about it, um, it is kind of a strange requirement, right? Let's say we're sending fuel to some device that's burning fuel. Worst case scenario, oh, are we on? Sorry, I just, um, I switched over oh. to the fuel domestified. You, you should be good still. No I just want to show them it. Um, so worst case scenario, it, let's say we got a, a loop, right, going uh, to and from uh, a generator or a boiler or something like that. We're, we're going to have, we're not going to have more fuel coming back than we're sending unless we're in a very complex situation with return pumps, you know, things like that. So having the line size, the line size, as I mentioned before, really isn't the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Um, the line size differential between the supply and return, it's just a place to start. And it's something that some jurisdictions look for as far as, uh, you know, checking a box. But it, it really isn't as critical as taking a look at what those flow rates are going to be and seeing if we need to actively return some fuel uh, on a critical high condition. Um, and if I could, Michael, look, I, I see one more question on here I'd like to touch sure. on. Absolutely. Uh, that um, what should be the option if the bulk tank is lower than 12 feet from the pump set? This is a really great question. So I actually have a facility where the way they dealt with it was to uh, uh, basically sign an email to us saying they're never going to run their tank below half full. Uh, that's not ideal, probably, uh, and probably not realistic. Um, but they didn't want to lift their tank up and they didn't want to, you know, move the pump set down um, with existing uh, existing equipment. 
So one of the things that we're seeing from the West Coast is a way to accommodate jobs. In fact, I'm doing a job now here in New England um, where we have an issue similar to this. And one of the ways we can do that, um, number one, we can do submersible pumps. Uh, I try to stay away from that if we, can, if we can help it because, you know, it introduces a lot of other factors. One of the other things that we can do is taking a, the overall system and asking, okay, as far as the main tank placement, that that may be able to move. So we have a project where the main tank is actually going at an upper level rather down at a lower level, allowing the transfer pump set to uh, pull fuel from that effectively. And then we have a booster pump feeding into that main tank. So there's actually a pump in the fill box where the operator would come up and fill the main tank up at a, a higher elevation so that we can now pull that fuel from the tank and send it up to the generators. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get around this. The 12 feet isn't a hard and fast rule. The 12 foot limitation there is to get um, maybe a second eyes, second pair of eyes on the project. You know, if it's if the bottom of that bulk tank is lower than 12 feet, you're definitely going to do things like run our sizing program. Talk to somebody, myself or someone uh, from a local office that has experience, because you can go lower than than those rules, but we have to make sure that everything else is 100% because built into that 12 feet is assuming there's going to be some losses to friction, assuming there's going to be some valve losses, things like that. We might be able to go lower if we can reduce our friction losses, right? That gives us a little bit of more uh, that we can play with on the head loss side. Uh, that might mean going from a high pressure drop anti-siphon valve to something like a uh, solenoid valve for uh, siphon prevention. So there are definitely ways around it, um, but at that point, if, if you're seeing a job like that where it's below that 12 feet, um, you're probably going to want to start exploring those non-standard options. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's just see. I think that's really about it. Alex, do you want to say anything before uh, we sign off here? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming um, and uh, really encouraging to see all you folks here. I know everybody is pretty busy uh, and that time is valuable, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, and we would really appreciate, you know, a phone call or an email. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us directly. Uh, I don't know if it comes through on the presentation or the question time, but we really enjoy what we do and really enjoy working with people on it. Um, on a daily basis, I probably have two or three different projects every day where I get to, to help consulting engineers uh, on a design or work directly with a facility. Um, and that's something we do too. If you're at a facility and you have some questions on your fuel oil system, um, we're not just going to try and push a cookie cutter solution on you. Uh, you know, we're, if we have to, we'll tell you who to go to if it's not us, but we really do want to work with you and feel free to reach out to us anytime. Yeah. Out, like Alex said, he, he kind of likes the excitement of weird jobs. <laughs> it makes it interesting. So, all right. Thank you everyone for coming. This presentation has been recorded and will be up on YouTube. You also, if you register for this webinar, you will be getting a link to that page on YouTube. So if you would like to watch it again, you're looking for something to watch on Friday night because no new movies have come out, feel free to go over and watch this again. But um, like Alex said, thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys on the next webinar. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.